my talk, and I just have a little message that we're going to convey to you. I know that there are some brothers here in this audience who used to serve at Bethel, there with some of your congregations. Others of you have uh, sons and daughters or relatives serving in Brooklyn or Patterson or Walk Hill. And we know that uh, many of you have had the opportunity to tour uh, the facilities there, and you enjoyed that. So perhaps you've got an idea of uh, what goes on in that beehive of activity. But the one thing that uh, the governing body and all the members of the Bethel family request of us when we serve Special Assembly Days is to convey to all of you their heartfelt love and greetings, the fact that uh, they keep you in their prayers. And so we want to pass that information on to all of you here, and you know what to do with it. There's no question that all of us are aware of the fact that uh, the world scene is changing, not only rapidly, but it's also worsening. The Apostle Paul uh, assured us of this in his second letter to Timothy when he said that wicked men and impostors will go from bad to worse, misleading and being misled. That's certainly happening today. And all of this reminds us of something the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Corinthians. In his first letter, chapter 7, and verse 31, he pointed out in his admonition that those who make use of the world should not do so to the full, because there's so much of it that's undesirable. But then he added another very significant phrase, and that was, for the scene of this world is changing. Now, if you're a little older in years, you can see how far-reaching those changes have been. And even if you're youthful, you can see it's different from maybe when you were in school. But 25 years ago, and many of you here can go back that far in your life, and you were at an age of responsibility or accountability, there was great concern expressed that the world is facing greater dangers than at any time since the Second World War in this past century. Uh, for example, an exiled Soviet novelist and Nobel Prize winner commented on the aftermath of problems following the first uh, two world wars in the 20th century. And he said, among other things, today's world has reached a stage which, if it had been described to preceding generations, would have called forth the cry why, this is the apocalypse. In other words, what's written in the Revelation, for example, about the four horsemen representing uh, war and pestilence and uh, disease or, uh, and other things that uh, uh, flick people and take them away in death. Well, what was the situation uh, two decades ago? You see, that's only back in 1988. So quite a number of you here can uh, think about uh, that decade. But the Encyclopedia Britannica described the world as being quietly but relentlessly rent by slow motion disintegration. You know what disintegration means? It means coming apart, right? And that's what's happening with this world. It's like it, it's just coming apart so quickly that uh, people fear it's going to collapse like the two trade towers did within an hour and 40 minutes. And we know what will happen, according to the Bible's prophecies, don't we? Now, what about the scene today? Well, we know what goes on from one day to the next. You read the newspapers or you listen to television news, if you do that. But the current events are so grim that, as one man put it, he couldn't decide whether or not he dared to watch the 6 o'clock news or if it's at 6.30, or at some other time, you can see it around the clock now. And they repeat the same old story, even highlighted in print. So, there's no question in our minds, is there, that we're living in the last days, when critical times, hard to deal with, would be here. 
is hard enough for the world. In fact, for them it's impossible to deal with in many cases. But even for us, you see, we're affected by what goes on in the world. We're uh, in the world, but we're no part of the world, are we? And that makes a difference because we do understand a lot of the meaning or significance attached to what's happening. And when we go out in the field service, we, with conviction, can talk to people about the last days. We have no in inhibitions about doing it because we've got a lot of support in this book, haven't we? How many of you have gone to a door and talked to them about the time of the end? Or read 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. One man, when a witness asked him to read those five verses, after he read them, he said, why, this is going on today. As if that was a revelation. And probably was. Because people don't read the Bible that much, do they? And maybe they've never read that scripture. I did it on an airplane once to a man who professed to be very religious and knew the Bible. He had never read that scripture. Or if he did, he didn't pay much attention to it. So we appreciate that uh, things are changing. You know what the Insight volume says uh, on this matter about the world as it was in Paul's day and the same elements are present and visible today? On page uh, 1055 of volume 2, it tells us back there, it was not the time period itself that set the fashion pattern or model for people of that time, but it was the standards, practices, manners, customs, ways, outlook, styles, and other features characterizing that time period. Well, how does it apply today? Isn't it shaping the way people are and what they're like? That's what Paul described, isn't it? He wasn't describing conditions in the last days. He was describing what people would be like. And they're responsible to a great extent for the conditions that are around us, under the influence, of course, of someone is goading them on. Well, who is that? <laughs> well, before we answer that question, we're going to ask you to take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 12. And we're going to read verse 2. Now, here... The Apostle Paul sounds a warning, something that we really should take to heart because uh, we're all vulnerable and uh, we could become victims. And we certainly don't want to become such. And quit being fashioned after this system of things. He didn't say, well, uh, maybe you better give some attention to uh, being no part of this system. He said, quit with emphasis. And he says, rather, be transformed by making your mind over that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We've proven that to ourselves, haven't we? We know what God's will is. He, we know what he wants us to do because his commands are set out in the scriptures. And we have a commission as to how we should carry out our responsibilities. But as we do that, we have to take care not to be fashioned after this system. You know what that word means? To be fashioned? We're not talking about fashions. We're talking about fashion, although fashion sometimes has a fashion people in the wrong way. But here is a meaning according to one dictionary. It carries the thought of giving shape to something. Humans included. In other words, we can be shaped or fashioned. And then uh, it means to mold into a particular character by influencing or training. So we may get training in many ways. Children are supposed to get training uh, by parents and when they go to school. We may get training on a job. Or we may be trained to get certain thought patterns impressed upon our minds by things that we're exposed to through our senses or what we focus on. So uh, we know that the devil is the instigator of this influence that's fashioning people according to this system of things because it's under his control, isn't it? The Apostle John says the whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. He's exerting that power in many ways. And you know how many people are affected? 
Is it just one nation? Is it only people in the Western world? Where we have a lot of the uh, media conveying information? No. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 12, and uh, then you see the description given in the 7th through the ninth verses about the war in heaven, in which Michael and his angels battle against the devil, Satan, the great dragon and serpent or deceiver, and ousted him and his demons out of the heavenly realm so he had no more access up there down to the vicinity of this earth. And he's full of rage, knowing that he suffered that defeat, and he's debased down here, and he's going forth to do what? Well, that ninth verse says, the scope of his influence is far-reaching. He would be uh, misleading all the inhabited earth. It takes in a lot of territory, doesn't it? It reaches up you in Stockton and Mantega, Modesto, California, all of the U.S., all of the nations of the world. The entire inhabited earth. Anybody can become a victim of his. Well, is that serious? We're in the truth. You so we're separate from the world. Well, so were the Corinthians supposed to be. You know what Paul said to them in his second letter, chapter 11 and verse 3? He uses an example of a woman. And this was not just a common woman. She was a perfect woman. But notice, despite her perfection, what happened to her. Verse 3 says, but I am afraid that somehow as the serpent seduced Eve by its cunning, your minds might be corrupted away from the sincerity and the chastity that are due to Christ. You know, the devil used something in her environment, something desirable to look upon, and when she focused on it, he twisted things because he said, you know, you're not going to really die if you eat that fruit because God knows that as soon as you eat that fruit, you're going to become like God. My, that's attractive, isn't it? You're going to know good and evil. Look how you're going to be enlightened. The bait worked, and she was seduced. Well, then she offered the fruit to Adam, and he also joined her in the transgression. But he being the head, has the chief responsibility because it's through one man that sin entered into the world and death through sin. You see, when Paul wrote this, he used the expression, I'm afraid that somehow, in some way, the devil, just like he seduced Eve, could get it used well. He wrote that to Christians, didn't he? So we have to take that to heart. We have to realize the import of that verse. And it wasn't just a woman that he seduced. He seduced a dedicated nation. Because what happened to them? The nation of Israel. Well, if you turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says the things that, be that befell them became our examples for us not to be persons desiring injurious things, something that would be detrimental to us. And then he mentioned they practiced idolatry, they became idolaters, and fornication, and thousands fell in one day because of that. And then he added, neither do you murmurs, just as some of them murmured, only to be perished by the destroyer. Now these things went on befalling them as examples, and they were written for a warning to us, upon whom the ends of the systems of things have arrived. If you're in the house, and someone sounds, and sounds a fire alarm, what are you going to do? Move! Aren't you? You're not going to waste any time. You're not going to say, oh, I've got to take my money. I've got to take my clothes. Oh, I've got to take my jewelry. Your life is at stake. You get out of the danger zone, don't you? Well, we take as a warning here because we're in danger. Otherwise, we could be become victims and succumb to some of these things that could lead to Straining our relationship with Jehovah, even loss of life, isn't that right? But do we heed the lessons? And a lot of people don't even heed the lessons of history, do they? You know, we've had history down through the centuries. What a 
adolescence that people have learned from them. They still war, carry on greater wars than ever, don't they? They haven't learned anything. Even in our, our modern times, from modern day history, after tubular wars and all the uh, bloodshed, nations still are building their arm, arm, armaments, aren't they? Their arsenals. So you see, people don't learn from lessons. They don't think it's going to touch them, but it can and does. So we can appreciate why we have to make sure that we're not fashioned after this system of things. And we know that the devil uses various means to fashion people. His aim is to turn as many away from Jehovah and his pure worship as possible. And he doesn't want them to become vessels for an honorable purpose. He wants to control them. He wants to maneuver them. So they serve his purpose, take his side of the great issue of sovereignty. And uh, there's something that's sweeping all of human society today. It's an element that is all over the world. And the Bible describes it for us very plainly in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Remember what that says? What is this element that permeates human society? It's the spirit of the world. That's the way Paul put it. It's an interesting phrase. And the, the reasoning book defines what that is. It's the impelling force that influences human society. So it's an impelling force, there's a pressure there to envelop us. And it's a dominant mental attitude or inclination. It's also described as a sinful tendency that permeates this world's thinking and powerfully influences the way people act. Well, how do we act before we learn the truth? It'd be a, an interesting story, but one just, we just assume to forget in many cases, isn't that right? Because we know what we were like then and the difference in what we're like now. But uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul exposed what this force or influence is and how it can affect us if we allow it to. Now let's read these two verses in Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verses 2 and 3. And uh, see if we can put ourselves in the position that's described pre and post. After the first verse, we says that we were all dead in trespasses and sins. He says, in which you at one time walked according to the system of things in this world, according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the spirit that now operates in the sons of disobedience. Well, we were sons of disobedience. We didn't know any better. We were ignorant, weren't we? But so we just went along with the crowd, didn't we? And then he adds, yes, among them we all at one time conducted ourselves in harmony with the desires of our flesh, doing the things willed by the flesh and the thoughts, and we were naturally children of wrath, even as a rest. Yeah, we could have been subject to God's wrath, his displeasure, because we were sons of disobedience. But we came out of that. The truth transformed our minds. We began to put on a new personality. What are we like now? We're different from the world and we're different from what we were like. So, you see, we're very thankful to Jehovah that we've been delivered from that former way of life because it wasn't getting us anywhere. We were miserable. Really. We were just wasting our time. And as one sister, she reached the age of 85, she had been a school teacher most all of her life. And 13 years before, there was another elderly sister who helped her learn the truth. And this 85-year-old sister says, you know, I wish I would have known the truth when I was a young woman. I would have changed what I was doing altogether. Well, we comforted her with the fact, well, be thankful for the last 13 years of your life. Those are the best years of your life. That's when you really came alive spiritually. That's why you lament the fact that you wasted so much time. But with eternity ahead of you, you'll make up, make up for it and a lot more. Well, that made her take a little different attitude toward things. We're thankful for the truth whenever we marry it. And we can appreciate then why we always have to be on guard that we don't go back to that former way of life. 
Now, what's some of the ways that the devil uses to try to captivate us? We're going to go through hurriedly about five things if we have, as time allows. One is harmful peer pressure. And you notice we said harmful peer pressure, so does that mean there's a good peer pressure? Yes. You see, if we associate with people that are spiritual, that kind of pressure is moving us in the right direction, isn't it? But there's, everyone has to guard against the popularity of doing this, that, and the other. Just as the Israelites should have. Because you know what happened to them? They succumbed to harmful peer pressure. And Jehovah had warned them, don't go following after the crowd for evil ends. You see, they were going in the wrong direction. That's why we got into all that trouble that we described in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. But all of us are subject to pressure. Every one of us. No one is exempt. You know what that is? What it is? Air pressure. Air pressure. Have you had a sea level? For every square inch, there's 15 pounds of pressure that's exerted. But we get used to it. But it's not always necessarily harmful, you see. But now, if you're subject to peer pressure that's harmful, that means you're in a situation or a position where you can be misled very easily. And that's why Paul says, uh, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Now, all of us at school or on the job, we intermingle and interact with uh, other people who are part of the world, aren't we? Don't we? And some of their thinking could influence us in our outlook. It could have a bad effect on us, especially if we become close to such individuals, because then we'll adopt their thinking, even their conduct. And uh, how is that? Well, you see, it might begin very slowly or gradually at first. And it might be such a common thing as the way we dress. You know, the way the world dresses today, some people like, especially if you go on the plane, they say they'll go on with pajamas, they don't wear any socks or shoes, and uh, they show their midriff. You know, after all, you gotta have a little dignity, isn't that right? Otherwise, you don't even have self-respect. One of their colors, one time we were on the plane, and a woman had half of her hair shaved off, and the other half was red, or purple, I don't remember what. I didn't even want to look at it. <laughs> you know, it's, it's repugnant, really. But she drew a lot of attention from others. Not that they admired it. They said, oh, that really extreme. But you see, some people want to attract attention, or they want to follow after the crowd. Well, we're different. We recommend ourselves as God's ministers, don't we? Then there's others who listen to debasing music. They say, oh, I don't care so much about the lyrics or the wording. I just listen to the music. And the, the rest of it just goes one, one year and out the other. Well, a bullet can go from one year and out the other. <laughs> but it'll leave a, result, a residue behind. And that residue that's deposited can be fatal. Isn't that right? So a person might think, well, I'm strong enough, I can resist all of that, but some of us there, it's registered, and it can influence one, like images that are immoral. So we have to watch our associations and make sure that the peer pressure doesn't get us down. Another way in which the spirit of the world is manifested is by advertising programs. You know, Nowadays, we used to watch the news, maybe one or two ads would appear, but now about every few minutes, there's as much ads as there is news. But if you don't watch television, you're exposed to it anyway. Advertising, you travel down the road, look at all the billboards that you see. Go into the city, all the glittering lights that are there. Get on the plane, all the glossy magazines that you can read, telling you about how you can enjoy life down in the Caribbean at a price. <laughs> and then uh, sometimes you, you find billions of dollars spent on ads because they know that what you see visually has an impression on you. And so we have to be on guard against the desire of the eyes and also the desires of the flesh 
and a showy display of one's means of life. So what they promote is not just a product, the advertising promotes a way of life, a style of living. And they'll tell you how happy you can be if you just take this product or wear this particular item. But it doesn't work that way because people go into debt and they are uh, over their heads in it and first thing you know they've got anxieties instead of happiness. Isn't that right? And they've got to pay heavy bills and pay heavy interest. That's what's going on now. So there are dangers in being lured to accept a materialistic way of life. And if you accept that style of life, then it's easy to persuade you to buy the product. The two go together. And you see, we have to be discerning, don't we? That's what the Bible says. Train our perceptive powers so that we can distinguish between good and bad or right and wrong. Now another thing that uh, we often hear about today is bad associations, and many of you young people can quote 1 Corinthians 15, 33 by heart. But you know, there's another verse that's very good, and that's Proverbs 13, 20, when it comes to associations. And if you see the contrast here, it really does uh, impress you. And it's wonderful how the Bible provides a principle to guide us. It tells us, he that is walking with wise persons will become wise. So if you associate with wise people who are spiritually inclined and spiritually strong, that rubs off on you. And certainly that's wholesome, that's beneficial to us, isn't it? But now the next part says, he that is having dealings with the stupid ones will fare badly. Not only will we say, how could I have been so stupid? And we were, because we're faring badly now. It led to things that we didn't expect or didn't uh, desire. So many times in school especially, you have to watch. Of course, if people are really immoral, or they're doing bad things, stealing, resorting to violence, we know we have to guard against them. But suppose there's a straight A student. Suppose it's uh, someone that is not promiscuous or immoral, and uh, they're not uh, drug addicts. One sister began to associate with a student like that, good student, had, uh, you know, generally speaking, you'd think, well, they were very fine associates, but they were part of the world. And as time went on, what happened? That student influenced our sisters to start reading spiritistic books. And after a while, the sister began to see, well, she's not a good associate. She came to her senses before it was too late. And so she stopped associating with that person because it was a bad influence on her. And now she had to get rid of whatever she had read, uh, read in those spiritistic books. So we don't want to be stupid, do we? Walk with wise people. Another subject that uh, needs to be given some attention is higher education. Now we're not talking about supplemental education. We're not talking about a basic education. We're talking about higher education where there are dangers. For example, one young brother wanted to learn about the engineering. Well, he could go to a, uh, could get supplemental training for that, but he, he took up a college course or intended to until he found out that if he was going to take that course, he also had to take up a study of philosophy. Now, what philosophy has to do with engineering, I don't know. But you see, he realized that he can't accept the package. They don't mix, fortunately for him. And then Colossians 2.8, uh, of course, could check one very soon, or flag him, because the Apostle Paul, in uh, Colossians 2.8, gave a little warning about uh, this uh, particular danger. Mm -hmm. Chapter 2 and verse 8, he said, Look out, perhaps there may be someone who will carry you off as his prey to the philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary things of the world, and not according to Christ. And that's a very good counsel, isn't it? I remember the brother that wrote his life story. He at first thought science had the answers to all of his questions, and he uh, majored in that subject at the University of Washington. Later on, he found out he couldn't get an answer from science about why is uh, all this around us in this uh, environment of ours on Earth and also in the heavens, 
uh, what's the purpose of it all? He knew a lot of facts about it, how things functioned and worked, but he didn't know why it was there. And one day when he was down in Arizona, he looked up into the starry expanse, and it's so impressive when you have those city lights to interfere, and he asked, what's behind it all? Why is it there? Science didn't answer that question. Two weeks later, he got the answer from a witness who happened to come behind and explained it from the Bible. That started them off on a Bible study. He came into the truth, and now he's a pioneer. He's an elder in the congregation, and uh, he knows the answer that he can share with scientists, even. So you see, uh, sometimes higher education doesn't teach us what the Bible does. Divine education is superior to anything in the way of education the world offers. Now, our last point is that mass media, sometimes this can influence us. Now, we may not take a lot of it uh, as the truth. It might be taken with a grain of salt. But there are 9,000 daily newspapers published. In the year 1988, it was estimated there are 275 million web pages on the internet. 275 million. That's uh, quite, a number, quite a number of years back, about 10 years ago. How many pages are there today? With all that information on that information highway, where are the, what's the point to the solutions? What's practical? How much is, it, is credible that you can really depend on? Well, there's only one. That's the watchtower.org organization that you find on the back of the page of the Watchtower. That's a website that will point you in the right direction because it's Bible-based, isn't it? But we have to guard against a lot of things that are published in the media. The uh, awake quoted an official of the German Commission for the UNESCO organization that claimed that our daily newspaper reading affects our attitudes, our conduct, even our fundamental moral values. And we know that to be the case. So there's a caution here. The inexperienced person, why he gives credence to every word, but the shrewd one marks his steps, weighs matters carefully. So if we watch something, are we rejecting what is false, or are we just passive? If you're passive, it saturates your mind. So you know whether to accept it or not. But if you reject it, then you're sorting it out. But if you see it's not the thing to look at, well then shut the computer or shut the television off, or if it's a computer, uh, then do the same. Well, we've hurriedly covered these points, and it may be helpful to us in the future. And we know how to cope with all of it, our Bible reading, our attendance at meetings, prayer to Jehovah in an earnest way, and then we can quit being fashioned after this system of things, stay pliable and soft so Jehovah can work us and maneuver or mold us in such a way that we will become useful to him as our owner and vessels for an honorable purpose in his organization. Then we can praise him from day to day and even for days without end. What a blessing that would be.